Um, but we can go ahead and get started um, just as a way of sort of overall um, organization. I'm going to be keeping time and transitioning between the different presenters. Um, so if you see me sort of frantically waving my hands, that means that you're getting close to running out of time. Uh, we'll also collect questions in the uh, the Q&A area or the chat. And if we have time, we'll answer them um, as we go through. And if not, we will um, get to those questions uh, at the end, hopefully. Uh, welcome, Julia. Thanks for joining us. Um, all right. So I will start off with uh, Catherine and Lauren from um, Invest in Open. Excellent. Thank you so much. So my name is Catherine Skinner. I'm the research lead at Invest in Open Infrastructure and also one of the PIs on this investigating costs and price in OA publishing project. Uh, I'm presenting today on behalf of both Lauren Collister, who is here with me and uh, navigating slides. Thank you, Lauren. And then also Gail Steinhardt, who's our research data analyst uh, on the project. Eric Shares, who's here in the background as well as a consultant on the project. So great project team. And we can go on to the first slide, first real slide. So our starting point for this project. Um, when the Nelson memo came out uh, back in 2022, we immediately noted the ripple effects that the new federal guidance was going to have on multiple stakeholder communities. And those include publishers, various sizes of models, uh, research performing institutions, and not just the kind of R1 uh, level, but also research labs like independent research labs, Cold Spring Harbor labs, things like that. Uh, community colleges, which actually do have uh, pretty significant uh, investments going on on their campuses as well. And then certainly all types of universities and colleges. Uh, societies and consortial groups also were going to get impacted in all kinds of ways. They work on behalf of the academic fields and disciplines, uh, super important players. Libraries, archives, data repositories, and others that are acquiring and maintaining collections were also going to get hit, and metadata and discovery services, and standards providers, and then, of course, your researchers, your authors, your users. I gravitate towards spaces like this, where there are lots and lots of stakeholders that are all being impacted. And the policy, and gui the policy guidance itself is explicitly intended to increase and advance equity and American scientific leadership and public trust in government science. And nobody's gonna question, or at least very few people are gonna question the value of those aims, but there are lots of people who are gonna question about how we're going to accomplish them and whether those implementation pathways and scenarios might be damaging to some of the stakeholders, especially in this case, some of the well-established publishers. So unsurprisingly, the reception, and as we've all seen, reception to the Nelson Memo has been polarized. Um, as a research team that works across the impacted stakeholder groups, we know the landscape and its land miles reasonably well. And we also know just how important it is to have some kind of a neutral space, or at least as neutral as we can create, where players and perspectives from all these different sides can engage and study where the potential points of shared interest are and intersections are, and also where gaps are. Um, all of that is to say that IOI has been very drawn to and interested in this specific area, the kind of stakeholder dividing controversies that arise and what's happening on all of these institutional fronts, the universities, as well as the societies, as well as the repositories, like how are they prepping? Um, and these include certainly big questions about who should pay, how much re is reasonable to charge and things like that as well. So we proposed a project to MSF in early spring 2023 to study and document how researchers and scholarly societies, publishers, libraries, and various data management scholarly communication infrastructure providers are actively planning towards their own implementations of the public accessibility mandates in the Nelson Memo. And we did it because we recognize this is a critical moment. So you've got this narrow window between 2022 and that initial release and 2026 when these policies are supposed to be in place, where not only can we identify what the range of implementation scenarios are, but we can also investigate any disparities or challenges that may be arising for specific stakeholder groups. So for researchers and institutions, that might include how to pay for specific publishing solutions. For other players like repositories, it might include how their business models prepare for a potential jump in submissions, especially for those who don't charge per submission or per deposit. 
So ultimately, we're looking to support institutions in their dis decision making uh, workflows and processes, in part by making visible the range of implementation scenarios that are arising in the research landscape today. Next slide, Lauren. So project components, we've got three pieces to this project. And to be clear, you know, we can't make this an unbiased story. That's that we're, we're not capable of that. I don't think anybody's capable of a fully unbiased study these days, especially not on a topic like this. But we are trying to talk to all the impacted stakeholder groups, and we're not coming in with some of the common biases. Um, it's not about for-profit versus not-for-profit versus government. That's, that's not what this is. It's about understanding the, what the spectrum is and presenting that in as fair a way as possible and acknowledging who is getting hurt in different ways and different scenarios and also how this is trying to lift everyone up in other ways. Um, so three legs of our project. First one is landscape review and analysis. There's a lot already known on you know, cost, on price, particularly uh, in the uh, kind of scholarly publishing space, journals, uh, articles. And in particular, we're building on some of the work that Eric shares, who's here and is also a consultant on our project, did back in 2022 at Iowa State just after the Nelson memo was issued. So his work, for those of you who haven't encountered it, used dimensions data to analyze or estimate the price of federally funded research publications. And then OSTP has built on some of that work and reinforced it using other data. We're starting to use OpenAlex and Cokie data as another comparison point, which is important, it's open data. Um, and then we're also running queries and analysis that are using DataCite to see what the data on data publishing and deposit can tell us. So that side is less studied, the data and data publishing part. And we wanna have as good of an understanding as we can of both the costs and the pricing on that front as well. So this presentation will uh, cover a little bit of a report that we just published, obviously, in lightning speed. The second element we're about to embark on right now, we're really excited about it. We're gonna be doing surveys, interviews, focus groups, and workflow mapping with three different groups. We're doing it with data repositories. We'll be working with 10 to 15 data repositories to just understand what it is that they're doing and how the costs and prices kind of get uh, channeled in that process. And in particular, as I've already mentioned, we're, we're very concerned about business models. Um, you know, institutional repositories are a good example of a group that don't charge. What happens if all of a sudden there is a huge uh, glut of submissions that comes in as a result of that? And how do you prepare for that when you're not charging per item in some way or when you don't have some sort of scaling that, that will uh, go along with that? Uh, we are also working with about 30 uh, research institutions of various types, again, everything from community colleges and independent labs to the, uh, the Research One universities and uh, uh, liberal arts colleges and everything in between. We really want to understand how they're preparing for compliance. Um, and as part of that, we're hoping to identify any clear distinctions and any clear disadvantages that are appearing based on type or tier or disciplinary focus. And then in the third leg, we're providing guidance to institutions. And so especially research institutions, but also to societies, also to publishers, also to consortia regarding what the spectrum of activity looks like and how their peers are responding nationwide. So what have we learned so far? Uh, next slide. So the first observation should come as no real surprise to anybody in this field. Nomenclature is so loaded uh, and vocabulary clashes are common and there are minefields absolutely everywhere. So a core problem in the stakeholder conversations about any kind of change here uh, include a lack of clarity about what it is that we're even talking about. So all the terms that I've put in quotes in this slide are understood differently or sometimes just poorly by different stakeholders that are engaged in open access initiatives. If we don't even understand what these terms mean in common ways, how can we possibly actually talk across the lines of different stakeholder communities? So part of what we've been trying to do in the first part of our project, where we're doing more of the desk research, quantitative research, things like that, is also just establishing what are some of the common language pitfalls that we see right now that are, uh, that are keeping people from being able to come together around solutions. Next slide. So this is the paper, uh, it's, uh, it just came out earlier this month. Uh, it actually was published on February 29th, which we loved. 
Um, but the, the thing that we tried to do in this paper is really synthesize what's known right now about research data and how it's uh, been produced, what kinds of curation activities are happening and what the cost uh, as well as the price looks like with that. So next slide. I love lightning speed. <laughs> Understanding the cost of providing public access to data is one big piece of this. When we say cost, and this does not match reasonable cost. So I'll, I'll mark that and we mark that in the paper too. When we say cost, we mean what are the uh, resources that are used up in the process of doing the publication? So there is no such thing as free publishing. There are things that subsidize publishing, but there is no such thing as free publishing, whether it's data, whether it's you know software, whether it's uh, articles, et cetera. So what we wanna do is understand what is the cost of providing public access to data. And of course that depends on how you're doing it. So we've looked at a number of different perspectives. We started with researchers and their institutions, and we looked at existing research that's going on. It's really, really great research right now with Coger and ARL RADS, and then some past research from Delamon and a lot of institution-specific guidance out there. We also spend a lot of time in the paper talking about data repositories themselves who have studied their own uh, workflows. And, and studies that have focused on those workflows. And those include a lot of projects that actually are back from like 2010 to 2014 that were there in the digital curation and preservation space um, that, are, that give us some good activity-based cost modeling. And then finally, we've been looking at the research funding agencies, some of whom have made their own estimates of what the uh, cost might be per, uh, per issue or per, uh, per grant. Next slide, please. So that's the cost. The other side of the equation is the price. Um, and what we wanna understand on the pricing side is you know, what are the sources of revenue for repositories? So structural support is one of those. A lot of times it's in-kind or um, sunk costs or just invisible costs uh, or prices um, that, that are charged to one institution on behalf of everyone. Uh, sometimes it's membership fees, sometimes it's deposit fees, and sometimes it's end user fees. Now the end user fees, of course, won't relate to uh, the open space here, uh, the public, uh, the open public and uh, the, I can't even talk right now, open public uh, publishing, but the or open access publishing, but the uh, deposit fees and end user fees are two of the ways that these costs have been absorbed by some groups and reflected back in price. And so understanding who's using that, how are they using that? And then what are these other methods? And what does that ultimately mean for the stability of our field as this work goes forward? Next slide. So on the cost and price of public access, we leave with a lot of questions and that's what the rest of our project will be helping us to answer. So how will researchers deal with these requirements? How are their institutions gonna respond and how are they gonna evolve their own support services uh, to support the researchers that are there with them? How are repositories of all kinds gonna evolve their services and their business models? And is sustainability an issue there? And then finally, we really wanna understand what we can understand of the components of reasonable price. And we want to know how to recognize what reasonable is. There's a spectrum of practice here. What does that look like? And what among that is reasonable? And moving towards the last, mapping the work, we are still at the early stages of this project. Uh, what we're just moving into is the surveys and interviews and focus groups that I just mentioned. And you can go to the last slide, Lauren. Uh, we are recruiting for phase two right now. So on the institution side, these are some of the institutions that have uh, already committed. We are gonna be continuing to recruit for another week. So if any of you are in institutions that might want to uh, learn more about this, please do come to us. Uh, and final slide, thank you very much. Those are our email addresses. Please uh, reach out to any of us if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Catherine. Really, really interesting work. Um, I think we'll save the question in the Q&A for the end, and we'll go ahead and go on to the next talk, um, which is Victoria from European Molecular Biology Laboratory. I will go ahead and share my slide now. So here, show. Oh. 
Okay. Does everything look all right? Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to present uh, monitoring of indicators and activities in open science to inform uh, European Molecular Biology Laboratory, uh, EMBL's open science strategy. So we are um, we have been implementing our open science policy for the last two years, and we have been also designing a framework around uh, monitoring our policy. So today, I would like to share with you uh, what we have learned so far and how that has informed our iterative and continually evolving uh, open science strategy. So today I also would like to um, make this an opportunity to call for alignment and knowledge sharing in research institutions in sharing their open science strategies and how they're monitoring their open science uh, policies. So first to give a little bit of context since we're coming from a European uh, context in comparison to many of the participation of the participants at the conference today. Um, uh, in the last two years, we've been uh, implementing the policy at this very large scale. So we are uh, Europe's only intergovernmental laboratory for the life science research. We're made up of 2,000 people uh, to, and researchers from 99 nationalities, and we are um, funded by funding from 29 member states. And in terms of the scale of the work, we're looking at 850 publications a year, and uh, we have 3,600 3, annual users of our experimental services. So we also provide a lot of sources of open um, uh, research infrastructure. And one unique thing about EMBL is that we are the host for EMBL EBI's data services, and we provide some of the most comprehensive uh, data resources and data repositories for the molecular biology field. And uh, we also have a very large program for courses and conferences, and that draws 8,700 participants a year. And uh, so moving on to um, the initiatives that we're doing at EMBL to improve how we do science. So open science is one part of our larger uh, umbrella of activities within our program to, um, in to improve research culture and the reach of um, science in society at EMBL. So um, this would not be possible with incredibly strong support from our leadership. And this is very much backed by our director general who is pictured here as well as our senior, uh, senior scientists. So I think this is uh, one big um, part that made open science and this movement possible, as I also see that for a lot of the, these initiatives that have been happening in the United States is very much inspired and also motivated by the leadership. So the second aspect very much related to our open science program is the responsible research assessment um, um, uh, program that we're committing to fair research assessment via updated practices and hiring and reviews. So we are signatories of DORA and COARA. So we have a lot of actions that have been implemented already as well in the last two years. So the things that the researchers are adopting in open science, we also ensure that there's a checkbox or a place where this is being valued. And alongside um, these open science and responsible research assessment uh, initiatives, we also have a very strong equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy. And this is an action to um, make a more, uh, to create a more inclusive research and work culture that leverages diversity in this broadest sense. And together with that, we're ensuring also science education, public outreach as an important part of our research program, um, aiming to increase uh, the visibility of our science and to inspire, inform, and educate a wider range of audiences and strengthen pu uh, public engagement. So these two um, EDI as well, science education, are a very strong part of our research program. However, it's not formally included in our open science policy. What is in our open science policy is um, uh, specific to the open research aspect. So I just want to say that we're very much including these as other aspects of the UNESCO recommendation for open science. However, it's not currently formally in our policy. So our open science roadmap is very much inspired by the uh, Center for Open Science framework, uh, which many institutions in many places have been adopted. So our policy is only one part of the equation. So the policy has came in place in 2022, and we have been implementing that uh, through a communication campaign, through uh, training, and also integrating it into every aspect of science that we can detect at EMBL. And the second part is to make it rewarding and recognizing open science practices and recognizing these leaders that are um, participating and leading open science projects. And the third part is uh, taking advantage of the current uh, training program that we have and making open science training and fair data, data management training as an essential part of the training of PhD students, postdocs and group leaders. So uh, we think that also training is one of the most organic ways to grow a community uh, from our experience. And lastly, is ensuring that there is available infrastructure to make all of this possible. As I mentioned earlier, we're very lucky to have um, our uh, 
to serve a European C, which is a literature big database. And that is also our institutional repository. So a lot of our work is uh, done together with European C to ensure uh, full open access of the publications, as well as um, better indexing and discoverability of preprints, et cetera. And we, um, we host our own uh, data repositories that are either um, field specific, specific or general um, repositories in the life sciences. So we all, uh, in addition to that, we also have our in-house uh, open source uh, relational database that uh, supports uh, data management as well as electronic lab notebooks. So making sure that all these pieces together, then we can make um, our policy uh, become a reality. So um, the policy specifically has three areas where we have new requirements. So the first is publications. So all Envil publications are required to be first posted as a preprint, and they're required to be shared uh, open access with a CC BY license. All of Envil's researchers are required to have an ORCID and also keep it up to date. All of the publications need to be in European C within six months of acceptance. And we have standards of acknowledgements and affiliations to ensure better discoverability of EMBO publications and as well as our funders. And when it comes to data, so all of the data that is behind research um, is, uh, is required to be shared in a community trusted repository. And each project requires um, a data management plan. And all of this, we recommend the alignment to the FAIR principles. The FAIR principles also applies to software. So the software that's behind Ample publications uh, also need to be open source by default and shared in an open repository. And that software behind analysis services, methods, and training. So these are the provisions of our open science policy. And so why are we monitoring this? Um, our entire idea behind the open science policy is to make it iterative. It's important to continuously monitor how we're doing and um, uh, adapt our strategies to adjust to, uh, to, to the changes and also keeping up to date to the latest best practices. So one thing we also believe is that by showing that the community adopts open science, this can create incentive to, um, to, inf to encourage researchers to adhere to the norms at EMBL. And also through the monitoring, we want to support open source uh, software and we want to support open research information, open databases. We believe that research information that's created by researchers should be owned by the researchers and at least should be public. So we see that this, this could be potentially an opportunity for some commercial solutions, and um, but that's uh, not what we're aiming for. We want to support the open databases. And one thing we want to do is to share our lessons learned with a wider community, also to learn from the community. How are you monitoring? And also, um, how are we looking at broader aspects of open science? And just to add a tangent here is that you don't need an open science policy to monitor open science. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, we can think that, oh, we can check how well our policy is doing, but potentially there are many factors influencing open science activities that are not only dependent on our, our policy. So it's important to look at the long-term trends as well. So first, to just start off um, by showing you how we've been doing with the ORCID campaign. So at the beginning of our, oh, sorry, Katie? Yeah. Just mm -hmm. one or two minutes remaining. Okay. Oh, one or two minutes remaining. Okay, sorry, I'm very behind on time then. So um, so I just want to say that we've reached from 60 to 90% of um, our ORCID uh, um, ORCID. Uh, uh, requirement in just two years. So that's one thing that we have been doing very well. And also just want to share also how we're share how we're monitoring our open science um, in, in our uh, total scheme is that we have centralized our publication uh, workflow is that we currently have a central I APC workflow. And through that is a touch point where we ask uh, our scientists, um, where do you have open data, open software and data management plans. And with the entire um, corpus of EMPOS publications, we'll look at the other open access aspects. So just want to say that, that at the beginning that we noticed incredibly high uh, adherences to open access. And to close that last gap, we have two steps that we're taking up next is to recognize referee preprints. And also we're moving towards the green open access rights retention. That's our next step. And with our open data, open source, we're, we saw a 20% increase in the first two years of um, in policy implementation. So from all of this, we have devised the following strategy, which is to increase recognition of open science uh, in our, in our, um, in our uh, reviews, and also to further improve linking of open science research outputs to make this more automated in the future. And also we need to have earlier integration of open science so that it's not an afterthought um, as it currently is. And another touch point that we have identified is to integrate open science into our facilities. So I just want to perhaps conclude with that 
that and say that um, this is a great moment for uh, research institutes to share ideas. And I want to um, have this opportunity to, um, to talk further with other uh, research organizations. So these I didn't really get into, but if you're interested, please contact me. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Victoria. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's so interesting to hear about the progress at uh, in Europe and in your group specifically. Um, can we have Jason for our third presentation? And everyone else, um, please feel free to enter questions in the chat in the Q&A area, and we will get to them at the end as we have time. Victoria, you have to stop sharing for me to be able to share. So. Thank you. Apology, just going back through. Okay. Everyone see that okay? Yep. Yes, looks good. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, so thanks for uh, having me uh, join you this afternoon. I'm Jason Gerson. I'm a senior advisor uh, in research infrastructure and innovation at the Patient Center Outcomes uh, Research Institute, or PCORI. Um, I'm here to talk with you a little bit about our experiences organizationally with our implementing our data sharing policy, which I hope you'll find of interest. So, um, I'll say a little bit about PCORI uh, for those of you that are not familiar. So PCORI is a US-based funder of patient-centered comparative clinical effectiveness research or CER. Um, so it's a genre of, of clinical research in which we uh, look at uh, established interventions that have an evidence base head to head. They could be behavioral. We do not plant our flag in any one disease area. So we fund ac across a wide array of diseases and conditions. Over, uh, overall, the, the studies we fund are designed to help uh, people make better informed healthcare decisions. Um, and we, were, we are an independent nonprofit research institute created with uh, the Affordable Care Act in the US. So. Uh, that's just by way of introduction. So uh, PCORI has numerous commitments to open science and data sharing is uh, one of them. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just gonna try and minimize certain things here, sorry. Um, so uh, here I'll just speak a little bit about the overarching uh, commitments and goals of the policy. So one is to maximize uh, the use and responsible utilization of data collected uh, <clears throat> through our through the studies that we fund. And the other is to imp improve the capacity uh, to conduct uh, patient CER. So we have patient-centered CER. So really the policy has two overarching aims in the clinical research space. One is to facilitate uh, the reproduction of analyses to uh, increase the integrity of the research we fund. And the other is to you uh, more in the meta-analysis and evidence synthesis space to, to take PCORI studies in conjunction with other studies, regardless of the funder that are relevantly similar or have relevant outcomes of interest and to integrate those studies to generate new evidence. So those are kind of the overarching goals of the policy. Um, again, I'll speak briefly about um, some features uh, of the policy. So this, uh, as you'll see on a subsequent slide, this went into effect in 2018 and had a long implementation uh, phases. We did some organizational uh, learning um, <clears throat> with our awardees prior to a uh, fuller implementation. So the policy itself specifies what data and de data documentation uh, are to be shared. So the way we think of it, we took our uh, cue from a 2015 Institute of Medicine report and really thought about a data package, which is, is not just the data set, but um, a co the constellation of documents that support it. So the statistical analysis plan, the metadata, uh, among other things that are enumerated in the policy. And we really wanted to create a place in a repository that's not that provides a full roadmap to the data set in which, you know, I think some of the challenges we were responding to in other repositories were that you simply find the data set without much further explanation or documentation, which makes it uh, difficult to navigate. And so we really wanted to enhance uh, the usability uh, of the data sets. And then so thinking about it, it's 
as a data package really enhances the, the value of it as a scientific asset. Um, so uh, importantly, we provide funding uh, to our uh, awardees, as we call them. We're not, they're, we, Macquarie issues contracts, not grants. So we refer to our research uh, investigators as awardees. And so we provide funding for them to support their data sharing activities, to prepare the data, to work with the repository, to curate the data. And we didn't want to make this an unfunded mandate um, for the awardees or to um, have them dip dig into their research uh, dollars that are already allocated as a separate um, budget item for them to do uh, to do the data to support the data sharing work. Um, the policy further continues to specify when the data will be made available for requests and describes third part the the request process for third parties seeking to uh, use the data. I'll say a little bit more about that. And it articulates criteria and, and um, for exemptions. But we have Macquarie Fund studies that include some proprietary data like EHR data, claims data, um, data from registries. So not all of these will be able to be uh, deposited. So we work closely with the awardees from an early stage to understand which parts of their data set can and cannot be deposited. And we make provisions uh, about that. So there can always perhaps be paths to access that proprietary proprietary data. So I say all this to say is like, we really, well, this will be a lesson I uh, drill, drill down on is to say work early with your awardees or grantees, understand their the nature of their studies um, so you can plan accordingly. Um, the policy articulates a number of privacy and ethical uh, protections. So one thing is that only de-identified uh, data gets deposited in the repository. There's a thorough scientific vetting of requests to use the data. Uh, the data contributor agreements that um, approved requests are signed uh, will include prohibitions against re-identification and redistribution. And one, uh, I'll add one thing um, that, you know, the approved requesters only can do their research in a virtual data enclave, so they can't download the data. All the There's a very rich uh, analytic environment that um, we provide for them. Um, but they, it's a, it provides another layer of safety that they simply can't download the data set and gives us a little more um, assurance. Um, so one thing that was core to the implementation uh, of our policy is to select a, a single repository and direct our awardees to deposit and uh, work with that repository. And that, that is um, ICPSR at the University of Michigan. They've been in business for decades. They're um, kind of a, a leading uh, US-based uh, data repository and archive. So after an op uh, competitive procurement, we selected them. Part of the, uh, part of the um, reason for doing that was we really were responding to an environment in which some awardees who believed in data sharing were really, you know, just depositing them in a wide array of repositories, which makes them hard to discover. And we worry about curation. So we really wanted to be a little prescriptive and directed, but also give them a really a true scientific partner in the repository staff. So they felt like they had collaborators as they were pre preparing their data for, for sharing. Um, this slide, which I won't belabor, just um, speaks to a timeline of activities uh, since beginning in 2018 uh, with the policies approval by our board of governors um, through to the current time. So, you know, the, the number of studies are accruing slowly. Um, certainly the pandemic took a hit. A lot of the studies we fund kind of went on pause for a couple of years and there were startup uh there were startup times um to get them back on track but um again we've been very deliberative in, in learning uh doing organizational learning about the policies implementation and the set of activities so and i'm happy to speak more to them um as if questions arise uh this a uh, couple of slides with graphics so again you can see we have 12 deposited 12 are in process will be deposited later this year so uh, additional pipeline. You can see the projected growth. Um, again, these are studies that uh, we think uh, have led, to, some of which have led to like very high impact publications, and we think there'll be uh, lots of scientific interest in them. So having them available in the repository will be um, hopefully a great use to the clinical research community. And these uh, are the deposit and in-process studies. So you can see the therapeutic and disease conditions in which they are. There's hyperlinks to all these studies at the, at the repository, which we've named the Patient Center Outcomes Data Repository or PCODER. I'll provide a rich set um, of resources and hyperlinks for you to access those studies and share with your colleagues who may be interested. 
Okay, so let me talk about uh, lessons, some of which will uh, will kind of repeat the things I've said. So I'll be brief here in the interest of time. So one is to be, we made an organizational choice to be directive with our awardees to really um, uh, give them the opportunity to work with a single repository that was practiced at the, at the science and art of curation that would mount the data packages on the web on the at the repository website in a way that would make um, it easy for requesters to discover, use, request access, um, see collaborations with the original uh, with the original data generators, et cetera. Um, the other th the other point, as I said, is to and uh, a real belief in starting early with each of our awardees. Some of their data, each kind of clinical research project, is a thing unto itself. Um, different data sources with different uh, sets of considerations and restrictions. This is also gets complicated in the rare disease space. So Procore is also a funder of rare disease research. So some of those studies have particular sensitivities. And so we work very closely at an early stage to understand all these, um, all these different contexts. Um, we're also very clear, uh, yes, I'm wrap, I will wrap up. Thank you, Katie. Um, I also, you know, we recognize and part of my work in the early days of the policies development is to recognize that PCORI is only one part, as a funder, is only one part of the ecosystem. There are very, uh, there are myriad players here, um, sponsors, academic institutions, publishers, health systems, among others. And we really need to work in a coordinated way to align the incentives to support data sharing. Um, and you know some more granular lessons that are probably PCORI specific and clinical clinical research specific. Uh, one um, is really to work with for funders to work cl closely and clearly uh, communicate your expectations, incorporate milestones or other deliverables related to data sharing early in your grant or contract, and that informed consent language and funded and our funded institutions IRB and data sharing policies are really. Um, they're quite varied and we work to be uh, rather uh, proactive and get ahead of them. So we're not, uh, we don't discover at the end of, towards the end of a study after most of the participants have been uh, recruited and enrolled that their data can't be shared. So we maintain a very proactive stance um, with respect to that. So I think I'll stop there. Happy to take um, other take questions at the end as time permits. So thanks. Thank you very much, Jason. Yes, we'll uh, we'll move on to our last talk. Um, we have Julia from Frontiers for that one. Hey, everybody. Let me just share my screen. Are you guys able to see this? Yes, thank you. Fabulous, great. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for, for joining and for, for being here on a Friday afternoon at that. Um, I am very, very pleased to be here and to deliver what turns out to be the last talk of, of the conference today. My name is Julia Kostova and I'm Director of Publishing at Frontiers. We are a leading research publisher and open science platform. In fact, the sixth largest in the world. And we publish peer reviewed research in a wide range of, a range of disciplines. All of it is free to read, to access and build upon. Uh, my role uh, is to oversee the U.S. strategy and operations, and I'm also involved in science and technology policy and advocacy. And so I'm really very honored to be a part of this conversation. I've been I've been listening over for, for the last couple of days, and it's been just really kind of exciting to see um, some of the uh, real progress that we've made in this direction. Um, and so today I want to highlight the vital role that we see open science playing in the context of our response to the climate crisis. To be clear, um, this is an enormous and very, very complex prob problem. We must transition to net zero by 2050. So that is in, in just 26 years. And it is in many ways, I think humanity's greatest challenge and endeavor, one on which literally <laughs> the survival of the global ecosystem hinges, right? So a lot is at stake and it is a very daunting task. So here's what I'll, I'll show you, just a, a piece of data to contextualize my, my, my argument here. We are currently emitting 51 billion tons of greenhouse gas. And to get to zero, as, as you can see, a steep decline in our emissions is going to be necessary. And to do that, I think, I think just the curve of this, of this function here demonstrates you know, the effort that is going to be needed. And I think to get there, we need an all hands on deck approach. 
I mean, surely a multi-pronged approach is going to encompass, um, you know, uh, a serious focus on inter in international policymaking. It'll include massive public and private investment in supporting this transition. It'll drive a revolution in individual and collective behavior, and, and among others. But more than that, we at Frontiers believe that science needs to be at the center of our efforts. Scientific knowledge and innovation can create solutions to this crisis. Better yet, sharing science openly can accelerate the kind of advancement that we need to respond to this crisis. Now, science has been a powerful and important catalyst in the world over the last couple of hundred years. It has helped us tackle so many challenges. Consider these achievements that science has brought to modern society. The smallpox vaccine has saved an, uh, an estimated half a billion lives and more, right? Polio vaccine has saved an estimated 120 millions of lives. More recently, oops, pardon me. Um, more recently, the COVID vaccine has helped, helped save lives very concretely. The same for blood transfusions, one billion and counting, for antibiotics, for anti-malarial drugs. Recent research in the in, in, in brain has already continues to yield results and to save lives. Genetic mapping, right? These are just samples. I, I think you, you know that this is not a comprehensive list and there is so much more that science has helped uh, bring to modern society. The point here is that all of these lives have been saved because of science and innovation in its application. And so for that reason, we believe that science needs to underpin our response to the climate crisis. That involves both new discoveries and existing scientific knowledge, whether it's for creating you know, non-polluting um, uh, materials like you know, cement, steel, plastics, whether it's for uh, finding new ways to create renewable or green electricity, whether it's for um, precision agriculture, Um, heating or cooling technologies. But as you saw from the previous slide, and I, I want to just, I think it bears repeating, we are in a race against time here. Here is how John I am absolutely convinced we will get to a low carbon, no carbon economy. What I'm not convinced of is that we will get there in time to avoid what the scientists have warned us of, which is the worst consequences of the crisis. If you don't reduce emissions by 45% minimum by 2030, you can't get to net zero 2050. So it's on us right now. We are in the decade of decision and of you know, essential production of uh, the actions necessary to achieve our goals. Yeah, and so, so this is the point that I'm making here. We are really in a race against time and we need to accelerate the speed of innovation and solutions. And here's the thing, the development of effective solutions to this crisis is predicated on access to the latest research and scientific breakthroughs, all of it, the code, the data, the, the journal articles, all of it. And herein lies the problem. When it comes to climate change research, only about half, 54% of research published in the last five years is freely accessible to read, access, and build upon. When it comes to breakthrough discoveries, like those in leading publications, the share of open, uh, openly accessible research is shockingly low. All the rest, over 1 million articles of new research uh, that is related to the Climate Action Sustainable Development Goals, sits behind expensive paywalls that are accessible only to institutions and universities who can afford prices subscriptions. They're not accessible to many scientists around the world. They're certainly not accessible to the 1 billion students in the science, sciences around the world, certainly not to practitioners, entrepreneurs, and innovators. And I think given that addressing the climate crisis needs the involvement of all stakeholders, from policymakers to researchers, to the private sector, even the public, and given that we want for those solutions to be grounded in evidence, I think it is imperative that access to all scientific breakthroughs be expanded and be expanded now. Now, we know that open science works 
and accelerate solutions and innovations. So this is a photo from just about four years ago. It is a haunting photo. To this day, it kind of gives me the goosebumps when I look at it. Um, but during the COVID pandemic, all COVID-related research and data were made available through open science, enabling researchers to find treatment and vaccine solutions in record time that without a doubt would not have been possible had this, been, had this knowledge, had this data been locked up. And that to me is evidence enough that when researchers open uh, and share scientific research at scale, they can mobilize, innovate, and ultimately save lives. In many ways, I think the climate crisis that our world is facing is even more, uh, even bigger, even more existential, right, than the COVID pandemic. And if we can do this for COVID, if we can open science to solve this unprecedented pandemic, then we surely must do it to stabilize the ecosystem that we live in. I think funders and governments are realizing, as we've heard over the last uh, couple of days, and certainly as we know from, from elsewhere, that there is tremendous potential in open science. Thus, the US recently issued these guidelines that direct all federally funded research to be, to be made available openly as well. Agencies like NASA are already, and, and, all, and a lot others are already moving in that direction. And this is certainly a cause that President Biden has long embraced, particularly in the context of his Cancer Moonshot initiative, arguing compellingly that paywalls slow down scientific progress and innovation. And so by contrast, here, I submit to you the value proposition for open science. Making science openly accessible will accelerate scientific discovery. It'll accelerate the innovation cycle and will stimulate the development of technologies and application. In areas like healthcare, open science can save lives and improve patient outcomes. In business and industry, it'll increase the ROI on research and development investments. In the policy space, it can drive evidence-based policies. And last and certainly not least, open science can bolster public trust in science. Now, we've, we've spoken a lot about the challenges, we've spoken a lot about the things that have yet to be hashed out, the frictions that every change in business model really involves. But I also think that this transformation is going to require all stakeholders in the ecosystem to act and to act now because a lot is riding on this, a lot is at stake here. I think it will require subscription publishers to transition their models to open, to open access publishing without delay. It will require funders and governments to mandate that science they fund privately or with that taxpayer money be published openly. It will require university leaders to make open funds available and to transform the academic incentive system to incentivize open science practices. A lot is going on in this area, and we're very happy to be involved in initiatives like Helios and, and, and uh, just to have science to be a signatory of DORA, among others, because this is such a critical piece. It will require that scientists publish and share their results openly, right? And last but certainly not least, it'll require innovative innovation in the open science uh, publishing. Thanks, Katie. Um, to drive innovation and to drive change in the way that science is disseminated. I think. Open science at this point is not a nice to have, it is a must have if scientists, innovators, governments, companies are gonna be delivering on this net zero mandate within the very tight, tight deadlines that we have. Last year in conjunction with COP28, Frontiers launched its open science charter. It outlines a roadmap to unlocking all of the world's science so that we can find solution to the climate crisis and many, many other crises that we face as a society. If you're a scientist, a technologist, a policymaker, a concerned citizen, and if you believe that science needs to underpin our response to the climate crisis, then I invite you to sign this charter, which has already been signed by um, over 2000 leaders in the world and which calls for all research related to climate change to be made available freely, like we did for COVID. We need to accelerate science. And I think that the best way to do that really is by making it open. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, we uh, just have a few minutes until it's time to transition to the next session. I believe the questions in the chat have been answered and the Q&A have been answered. So I will ask uh, a final question uh, before we disband. 
Um, it struck me as I was listening to all of the presentations together. Um, it's a really uh, unique collection of presentations spanning the policy uh, world, but also all touching on um, issues related to resourcing. Um, so I, a phrase that stuck in my head from uh, the first presentation from IOI um, was there's no such thing as free publishing. <laughs> and I think we could extend this to there's no such thing as uh, free sharing of of data and information and so on as well. Um, the middle two talks really emphasized the um, high levels of investment that are um, beginning to be offered by a variety of organizations to make these uh, important policies a reality. But for all of the presenters, I guess that's my question is sort of like, what's this tension between, <laughs> how do we deal with this tension between the fact that um, increasingly people are recognizing the value of these activities but there are, you know, resource constraints that make it so that the um, there's not an immediate uh, uptake of these things. I mean, resources are just one piece of it, but um, I think it's an it's an interesting piece to start with. Would any of any I'll take a volunteer of any of the speakers if anyone feels passionately about that and wants to speak on it. <laughs> I'll do the two second response to that and then hand it off to my uh, co panelists. Uh, the there is no easy answer. <laughs> Um, you know, we're in a system where there are too few resources to support what's happening already. And there are also too many solutions uh, in some ways to provide uh, infrastructure that is sustainable. And so some of it has to come down to some level of consolidation and uh, at least around methodology um, mm -hmm. and platform. So that would be my quick. Thank you. Would any of the other speakers like to contribute? Yeah, so I want to add that perhaps one way to look at it is that in the short term, potentially, it's very resource demanding. But ideally, in the long run, we could see that this adoption will become just a new way of doing things. And then this will, in the long run, be even reduced resources, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'll just add, like, when we did kind of our calculations relative to what the overall research spend is for PCORI, the investment in data sharing is fairly fractional and small. And it just seems like the investment to treat these as scientific assets, which they are with some degree of public investment. So they encourage the reuse over time to, to basically further science seems, um, I wouldn't say it's a no brainer, but and I think you have to be patient to see the actual uptake, particularly in the clinical research space, which has uh, historically been slow, but it's worth it's worth it to Pecoria to make this investment. Um, and even though it may take some time to see the quote unquote results from it, uh, doing it in and of itself is a virtue, so. Absolutely. And I was just gonna, if I could just very, very quickly uh, weigh in here, I was going to make a comment in the, along the lines of, of uh, Victoria's response and somewhat um, Jason's. I think it is absolutely right that um, that in the short term, this is a daunting task. It requires quite a bit of, uh, of investment. Um, I also like to think that th whenever there is such a massive change in business models, uh, you know, regardless of the sector, regardless of the industry, but I think particularly with ours, when there are so many other stakeholders involved in it, that kind of friction is inevitable. It happens always, regardless of the of the, of the industry that is impacted. And so, um, so that's that's the first comment that I, that, that I will make. I also do think that thinking long term, though, this could be very productive um, investment as an investment purely financially. Um, you know, there's so much evidence about the value that openness, um, you know, can generate, right? And so, I don't want for us to think about this as a cost. I really, you know, like where there may be short term cost implications, absolutely. Um, but I would like to frame this conversation in terms of a long term investment uh, that will continue to drive returns. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much to all of the presenters. Um, there is actually one further session today, some more lightning talks, one more round. So uh, please enjoy those and uh, enjoy the rest of your, your day or your evening as it as it may be.